Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Would you stand with us as we begin worship this morning as we sing, All I Have is Christ. together and worship we're going to take a moment and sing a wonderful old hymn we're going to sing it as well with my soul even if you're not one of our home folks you probably know it if you grew up in church anywhere let's sing this song and worship as we sing it's well with our soul when peace like a river
can we do that at First Baptist? Is that okay? I believe the psalmist told us multiple times to shout, to sing, to raise our hands and to praise. I hope we do it all this morning, church. Hope we do it all. You know, this morning, we've sung some songs talking about all we have is Christ. And just sung a, sung a hymn that was actually written out of a time of great grief where a man had just lost multiple people in his life, family, dear to him. Just thinking about the will of God. And my mind this morning went to Matthew chapter 6 and the Lord's Prayer. If you know it from heart, you just say it with me. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know what strikes me about that? As he's teaching his disciples to pray, and even in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know what our Lord and Savior prayed for? The will of God. The will of God. This morning, this next song echoes some of those same sentiments. And I pray that whatever, whatever we might have brought in here with us, that as we worship, we would settle on just desiring the will of God, especially in this moment. Sing this song that echoes some of this wonderful hymn. Sing it. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart. songs of loudest praise teach me sun melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming Your grace is always 
God's people said, Amen. You can be seated this morning. It is great to see you out this morning here at First Baptist Church. Again, if you are a guest here with us, we are so thankful that you chose to join us for worship this morning. A lot of churches in our area that you could have joined, some great churches that you've chosen to be with us. At this time, before we move any forward, any, any more forward, I'm going to ask somebody to grab the pulpit because this is what I usually do. Can somebody grab the pulpit and bring it out here? We're going, and we're going to dismiss our children, kindergarten through fourth grade. If you're a great guest, we've got a great time for them just outside in one of, the, one of those classrooms out here, kindergarten through fourth grade, and uh, you can pick them up immediately following the service. And I'm, I need to get out of the way. I'm not used to this. Blake does this, but Blake's preaching this morning. And you don't ask the guy who's going to preach to bring his own pulpit forward. I think Wes would preach without a pulpit before he'd get, I, I just think they, they would. So uh, pray for Wes. Wes is on vacation. Again, if you're a guest, um, please come back. Uh, in a couple of weeks, our pastor will be back. He'll be gone out next week as well. Uh, but just a, a few things just to be mindful of, some really, really cool things going on. How many of you got to be a part of our block party, Vacation Bible School this week? Uh, had a great time this week. Uh, really, really cool things happening here at First Baptist. And, of course, that's all made possible by our, our tithes and our giving part of our worship here at First Baptist. If you'd like to give, of course, you can do so this morning on your way out. Uh, we've got boxes at the entrances. You can also uh, use the text to give. It's become a really, really convenient and popular way to, to give your tithes and offerings. You can text FBC Mayfield to 73256. And also be aware that you can still mail it to our office address, not the church address. Mail it to our office address there at 100 WK&T Technology Drive, building 1100 right here in Mayfield. Really don't have a lot more announcements, but just want to just thank you for being here this morning. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds for the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time, thankful for this place, and Father, thankful that we have the freedom and the opportunity to hear from your word this morning. And Father, as we've had a time of worship, and Father, as we, as we are seated and we are just taking a moment, Father, I pray Lord, that you clear our hearts and our minds of anything that might distract us or take away, Lord, from what it is that you have to say to us this morning through your messenger. And may God, God, may you do all that you see fit and have your perfect will and way in this place. And then we pray and ask. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, church. It's a privilege to be able to preach this morning and do be praying for Wes as he gets some needed... Uh, time away. Uh, as many of you know, since December 10th, like we as a staff have been uh, going pretty pretty hard. So it's going to be probably very refreshing for him to just take a few weeks to kind of decompress and then come back and start again. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. This week we're going to begin a two-week journey through the book of Ruth. This is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and one of the most moving stories in the Old Testament. And, you know, I want to be careful. This is not just a love story spread out over four chapters of Scripture. This is a story within a story, a story part of a much greater story of which we too are a part of. It's a story within a grand tale of redemption of who God is. How God is redeeming a people for himself, bringing them from death to life, from bitterness to fruitfulness, from emptiness to fullness, curse to blessed, and despair to delight. All of this in Ruth. And you and I found ourselves in the middle of this story. So we're going to camp out in chapter 1 today. Uh, last night, it was about 10.30 or so. And our goal this morning was to go through Ruth chapter 1 and 2, but I found myself just really conflicted because if we move through that, that's a lot of ground to cover in just 35 minutes. So what I did, I didn't want us to walk through chapter 2 and just breeze through all this stuff and really miss some of the big things that are going on there and kind of have this surface level understanding. So what I chose to do was I took out everything of Ruth chapter 2 last night and just focusing on Ruth chapter 1, and I think that will help us. Now with that, 
Uh, next week we'll be in Ruth. We might not be done and get through the book the way we would want to, and that's okay. I would rather us come away from this of really understanding what we do cover than have a surface level understanding of just the whole book. So that's what I've chosen to do. And some of you may have read Ruth before. Some of you may have not read Ruth. Maybe it's been a long time since you've read the book of Ruth. But let me encourage you. Don't be like some of these novel readers who you get a big book and you go immediately to the end to see what happens. Don't do that. Don't go to the end, read the last few pages, see where things are going so that you can come back to the front. I want to encourage you not to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is I want us to walk through this book step by step without looking ahead. Now, once we get to the end and we find out what happens, it's going to help us understand where we've been. But what I want us to feel the tension here. There's a lot of tension in this book. I want you to feel the tension of what the original reader is hearing. And not just that, I want you to feel the tension of what the characters in the story are feeling. The people in the book of Ruth are feeling a lot of emotion as they're walking through this journey. And I want us to feel the weight of Ruth chapter 1 this morning. So we're going to dive in. Verse 1, we're not going to get very far. Let's just look at verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Let's pause there. So the author of Ruth, we're not sure who it is. The author introduces this story with two elements right out of the gate, the time and the place. So he gives us the time and the place. The time is in the days when the judges ruled. So just to the left of the book of Ruth, we have the book of Judges. And if you turn over probably one page in your Bible to the end of Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, the last verse of the book gives a summary of what's going on in Judges during that time. Let me just read that. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that's a summary right there of the entire book of Judges, summed up in one verse. The book of Judges is just a cycle there's no king in the land. Everybody's doing what he saw fit. There's constant spiritual, social, political unrest. The people are in rebellion against God. And this is before the king. So before we had Saul, David, Solomon, what you've got is a time of where everybody's just kind of doing their own thing. And this is a time and a place when there's a famine in the land. Our second point there, there's a famine in the land. So a famine in the land of the people of God, particularly in Bethlehem, which is interesting because the Hebrew for Bethlehem means the house of bread. So the house of bread has no bread. There's no food. There's a famine in Bethlehem, and what happens is a man from the people of God takes his family, turns back on the land that God has promised, and he goes to the land of Moab. So just some background on the land of Moab that kind of is going to help our understanding in this book. Moab has roots from Genesis chapter 19, verses 30 through 37. That's the beginning of Moab. And we're not going to read that today, but it's Lot and his daughter, and they have this uh, incestuous relationship, and this is how Moab starts. So not on a good note, right? That's the beginning. And as we fast forward through the Old Testament... The people of God, Israel, are attempting to pass through Moab, and these Moabites told them, no, you cannot come through here. So this caused division between them and the Israelites, and it became such an issue that there's a point when Moabite women, okay, you've got to catch this, when Moabite women seduced Israelite men into sexual immorality and all kinds of idolatry. And God brought judgment down, and 24,000 people were struck down and killed in Israel. That's in Numbers 25. So this is a place that is known particularly where the women are known for all kinds of sexual immorality, a place that is known for idolatry, the worship of false gods, enemies of the people of God in Israel. And this is where a Jewish man takes his family... To Moab. Right, so this is just the setting the stage. All of this, very first verse. Jump down with me, verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, 
And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. So now we've got the time, place, and the people. The man's name was Elimelech. You might circle that or underline it. Elimelech literally means God is king or my God is king. Which you think about it, in a day when there's no king in the land, the first picture of a character we have in this story is a picture of God is king. And I think that's very purposeful that the author is doing. And his wife, Naomi, is following her husband as he makes this decision to lead his family out of the promised land with his two, uh, two sons, Malon, Chilion, into Moab. Now we're going to go into verses 3 through 5. And what you've got in these three verses is a literary device that the author is using, and he does not give you any details. There's nothing here. You just have brutal, cold, hard facts one after another. Just kind of feel the coldness in these verses, starting in verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. and She was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So a 10-year nightmare summed up in three quick verses. No details, no story, no background. It's just one tragedy built upon another tragedy built upon another tragedy. Elimelech died. The man who provided for Naomi brought her into this land, gone. We don't know how. We don't know what happened. But now she's left as a widow in Moab with these two sons. They married Moabite women, building upon another tragedy. Moabite women. Like, this is not how Naomi, I can't imagine that she had planned these things in her mind and pictured her family looking like this. She'd heard stories of Moabite women, and now her sons have married them. Picture the women who have indulged themselves in sexual immorality with Israelite men in the past. This is who's in her home now. It's not what she intended. They lived here about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died. We don't know if they died at the same time, uh, close to one another, but all of a sudden, Naomi looks around her. Her husband is gone, her two sons are gone, and she is at home with two Moabite daughters-in-law. She's lost everything. She's lost her security. She's lost her family. She's lost her providers, and she's lost her hope. And to heighten This whole picture, as if it couldn't get worse, is the fact that Naomi is not only a widow and not only without sons, but the daughter-in-laws that her sons have married are childless. They're barren after 10 years, no kids, which means no descendants, which means no one to carry on her line. This is the curse of all curses in ancient Israel. Your name stops with you and will not continue on in your line if you don't have somebody in your family. You don't have children. That's the depths of despair that we see here in verse 5. Five verses, and this is really heavy. You get to the end of the verse 5, and it says, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. What's interesting is for Naomi, the author doesn't even mention her name. Instead, she, he just says, the woman was left without her sons and her husband. He doesn't even identify who she is. She has nothing. Despair, hopelessness in just five verses. And it sets the stage for us, a glimmer of hope in verse six. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields, fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So this is a small picture of what we're going to see in this whole book. What we're going to see is darkness in the middle of this darkness and hopelessness, a light of hope coming in from God, right? Look at this verse. It says, who brought the food? Who visited the people? The Lord did. It wasn't anyone else. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't that they had a good crop year. It was the Lord had visited. And what we're going to see here is the Lord's faithfulness and his provision, 
This is the picture. God had visited his people in Bethlehem and had given them food. He had come to their aid. So Naomi hears this news that bread has returned to Bethlehem. There's food. And so she begins this journey back to Bethlehem. And on the way, she is trying to dissuade her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, from going with her. And it's for their good, right? She's not trying to dissuade them because she doesn't want them to. She's trying to do it for their benefit. It would be better for them to stay, to stay back in Moab, to find a family, find a husband, start families. If they were to come with her, they would be committing themselves to perpetual widowhood and childlessness. Naomi builds a great argument for them to stay. Here's what she says. Let's look at verse 11 through 13. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, you may, that may become your husband? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So a little background here in Deuteronomy. God had set up a way for widows in these situations to be provided for, just like Orpah and Ruth. If your husband died, then what would happen is a brother would basically take responsibility for caring for you, and you would be cared for by his brothers. The picture is because both sons have died that there is no brother to care for Orpah and Ruth, no family to care for them. Naomi has nothing. So Orpah is dissuaded. She turns. She goes back to her people. But in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, one of the most majestic pictures of commitment in Scripture Ruth clings to Naomi, and this is what she says. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will, be, will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. But Ruth says, I'm going with you. Your people are going to be my people. Your God will be my God, and I'm going to be buried with you. And think about what I want us to realize is think about what Ruth is leaving behind. Like she's leaving behind her land, her family, everything that's familiar to her, her religion, her gods, her security. She's giving her future completely to this widowed, childless woman. She's coming, she is uh, committing her future to this perpetual widowhood and childlessness. That's what she's doing. And it's not just in this life. So in ancient Near Eastern thought, where it was kind of like this, like whom you went with and whom you were buried with had implications for the afterlife in ancient Near Eastern uh, culture. So she's saying, I'm going to be buried among you and your people under your God. Everything from this point forward is fully committed to you. And you can just imagine the intensity in the scene as Ruth is. She's clinging to Naomi, and she releases her grips on her, looks her in the eyes, and says, I'm committed to you. Don't try to stop me. Don't try to talk me out of this. I'm going with you and your people and your God will be my God. And if I break this commitment, then your God will judge me severely. This is profound. Like, this is so profound that the rest of the journey to Bethlehem is in complete silence. We don't even hear a response from Naomi. It just soaks in in verse 18. It says, when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. You can imagine just the intensity and the awkwardness of this. And then they enter into town, and people start going around and saying, like, is this Naomi? Like, is this Naomi? Is she come back? And you can imagine people start coming up to her and like, Naomi, like, hey, 
I haven't seen you. And people who come up to Naomi, and maybe it was welcome, maybe it was shock, maybe they're just surprised to see her. It's been a long time. And those people that are coming up and saying, like, hey, Naomi, you're back. They got a response that they totally were not anticipating. Verse 20. She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? You see, as soon as she hears her name, her name literally means pleasant or lovely. So when people come up to her, they're saying, Naomi, pleasant, lovely. And she looks back at them and says, not at all. I am bitter. I'm a different person. I'm no longer pleasant. I'm bitter at everything. I left here full with everything I needed, everyone I loved, and I come back here totally empty with nothing. And you can imagine the tension in the group that's listening to this, but now put yourself in Ruth's shoes. Let's take back from Naomi. Let's put ourselves in Ruth's shoes for a moment. You're coming with Naomi into the city, and you're coming into a city that there is no doubt prejudiced against you. You stick out. Everybody is turning their eyes as you walk in and looking at you. There's a Moabite in the camp. And you know this is part of what you risked in verse 16 and 17. You knew that this was going to be a reality, but now it starts sinking in for the first time. Like everybody's staring at you, and they're shocked that Naomi is back. And then they're looking in total bewilderment at who she has brought with her, a Moabite woman. Your people are known for seducing these people and bringing judgment of God Upon them. So you're standing there quietly as people are starting to talk to Naomi and she responds to them. Now picture yourself, you're standing there in Ruth's shoes, and as Naomi looks into this small groups of people, small group of people, and she says, I left here full and I came back with nothing. And you're standing right beside her. And they're listening to Naomi and they hear her say she has absolutely nothing, and they turn and look at you, and all you can do is just look down because you are considered less than nothing. You are a picture of misfortune from the Almighty, according to Naomi. You are a symbol of the Lord's affliction as you stand beside Naomi. And the author says in verse 22, so Naomi returned and Ruth... Not just Ruth, the author says Ruth the Moabite. Like he even goes in, like you already know, but he just draws in as if it wasn't already obvious. The author points out this tension. What is a Moabite doing in this strange place? Her daughter-in-law was with her who returned from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. All this tension All this drama in just 22 short verses. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I want us to take a step back. By the end of this chapter, we are really left with two characters in the story, Naomi and Ruth, and they could not be more different at this point in the story. So on one hand, we have a woman with some genuine, honest hurt. Naomi has some honest hurt. Based on her last words in chapter one, we probably, you know, don't have such a favorable uh, impression of Naomi at the end of this chapter. She's a bitter woman. But before we're really too hard on her, let's make sure we think about what she's been through. This has indeed been a 10-year nightmare for Naomi. She's lost her husband, her sons. She's found herself in the middle of Moab with daughters-in-law from a pagan land with no heir to carry on her line. She's lost everything. Genuine hurt here. And don't miss this. 
I think this is similar to the book of Job. She's experienced suffering not due to any particular specific sin in her life. The author doesn't bring that up. He never says, this happened to Naomi because she had done this. I think this is similar to Job in a sense that it's unwarranted, unexpected, and mysterious suffering. Why? Why is this happening? And this is what Ruth is wrestling with. She's struggling with why this is happening. And I love the honesty of Scripture here. Scripture's not glossing over the reality, not just in life, but the reality in the lives of people who follow after God. The reality is, according to Scriptures, that people who follow after God experience suffering and trial and tragedy. Scripture is not glossing over that. And I'm guessing that if we're honest with ourselves, there's a variety of times when we find ourselves identifying with Naomi. Do you ever feel like the providence of God is against you or it's been hard on you? Have you ever felt or ever, do you ever feel, even in this moment, like the weight of your circumstances and your situation is too heavy to bear? Do you ever feel like it's just been one thing after another thing or something just won't go away in your life, like it's honest hurt. I think we experience this. We have this picture of Naomi, and on the other hand, we have Ruth, a woman with humble devotion. Humble devotion. The more you read verses 16 and 17, the more amazing that they are. All that Ruth has left, all that she has surrendered to do, this ultimate commitment Right in the middle is an intentional picture. Right in the middle of her commitment, it says, your people will be my people and your God, my God. This is surrender, not just to Naomi. This is a surrender to the God of Naomi. This is forsaking all that she knows for what she does not know, but she trusts him. Our prayer needs to be a prayer that continually God would raise up people in this church who forsake earthly pleasure, worldly uh, security, comfort, and boldly with adventurous faith trust deeply in God that does, and they would do stuff that makes no sense at all to the people in the world around them, and they do which seems to forsake all the good stuff that the world has to offer and says, I'm going to trust you God, not just now, but for all eternity. Bold abandonment and devotion to the Lord. Humble devotion. Complete surrender to him. And I think this is the picture of Ruth that we're getting. And I pray that God would raise up men and women in this church who are willing to stake their lives in this abandonment to God and the call on their lives. That they would be willing to devote themselves fully and surrender to God and say, I'm going to follow him because he is worth everything. I'm going to forsake everything else and trust in him, even though I might not see it at the time. And I might not fully understand it. We've got these two totally different pictures, a woman with honest hurt and another woman with a humble devotion. And I think that leads us to, we've got these two people, and I think they have two points of need here. As they come back to Bethlehem, they have two basic needs. And I think this is part of the tension that the author is setting up here, two needs. They were in need of food, number one. They were in need of food. They had obviously left in a time of famine, and they were coming back in a time of feasting. It's at the time of the harvest. But the problem was, who is going to provide for them? Men were providers in the home, and they provide the necessity of food, which leads us to the second need. They were in need of family. Not only did they not have a husband or sons to carry on their lines in the future, They didn't have a husband or sons to care for them in the present. They were in need of food and family. And this is setting up this tension. And I think this is one of the main problems in the book of Ruth is how these two widowed, childless women can survive in ancient Israel. I think this is one of the problems that we see. They're in need of food and they're in need of family. Now, in each of these 
verses, every word, every phrase, what we see is the author giving a subtle picture amidst the rest of the scene, a subtle picture of who God is. And they're sometimes extremely subtle, but I want to show you in this chapter two pictures of God. So the reality is, in Ruth, sometimes we can struggle to see God. And much like sometimes in our lives, sometimes we struggle to see God in the same way. But I want to show, I want to show you two pictures of God that the author of Ruth is putting in this scene before us in Ruth chapter 1. They're both surprisingly in what Naomi says at the end of the chapter. Look at verse 20. She says, don't call me Naomi, she told them, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So this is the first time she mentions God, and the second time, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The third time, the Lord has testified against me, and finally, the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. That's the fourth time. So four times in these two verses, she mentions who God is is. What's interesting is she uses two different words to describe God. Four times, two different, two times she uses one word, two times she uses another. And here's what I want you to see, this picture of God, two characteristics of God is brought out in these verses. Number one, he is great. God is great. The first word she uses, she says, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She does not use a name for God here. You might even have a note at the bottom of your uh, Bible that says, not the name for God. It's a title, actually, for God. And in Hebrew, the title is Shaddai. You might be familiar with the Hebrew. It says El Shaddai, which means uh, God, God, God Almighty. Shaddai is a title for God that emphasizes his uh, power, his supreme sovereignty over all things. And this is what Naomi is confessing in this verse. In the depths of her bitterness, she says the Almighty has done this. And here's what I want us to realize is that Naomi is totally right. There's not one detail in the book of Ruth that is not totally under the sovereignty of a great God. There's not one detail in the book of Ruth that's attributed to chance. And later on, we'll see how the author uses that and kind of brings that out. But the picture here is Naomi is saying just like what Job says. And it's interesting, in Job, 30 plus times he uses the word Shaddai in the book of Job. And in Job chapter 27, verse 2, he says almost the exact same thing that Naomi says here. Job 27, 2 says, As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty, Shaddai, who has made my soul bitter. This is the same Job that would say God gives and God takes away. The same Job that says, Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? Job knew that God was sovereign over all things, and Naomi knows that God is sovereign over all things. And you'll hear people say, and I've even read in commentaries this week, uh, Naomi's faith seemed weak at the end. And brothers and sisters, I will take this kind of faith over some kind of shallow faith that we bring to suffering and tragedy in our contemporary culture any day. Even in church, you might hear stuff, uh, not here, but just saying, that, but you'll hear in church culture of people saying, like, God didn't know this was going to happen, or God was surprised by this, or he's just as surprised as you are. God's doing the best that he can. There's some things that are beyond his control. That's just not true. We don't have a puny God who is surprised and shocked and unable to keep things under control. We have a great God who is sovereign, who is omnipotent and almighty, and this is a rock to stand on. He's never caught unaware. He is always in control, and this is how we can know that he's working all things together for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purposes. 
It's how we can stand and say God is sovereign over everything. He's sovereign over nature. He's sovereign over disease and cancer. He's sovereign over illness and death. He's sovereign over all our circumstances. That is a rock to stand on. He is almighty. He is great. Now, the question that comes with that is, well, if he's sovereign, then why, does, why do these things happen? If he's great, can he really be good? And these things still happen, and the answer the book of Ruth gives us is yes, he is. He is good. He is great, and he is good. And you get this picture in verse 20. He says, call me Mara because the Almighty dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord, circle that right there, the Lord. This is what we've already seen in verse 6, but the word that she used there is the covenant name of God for his people, Yahweh. That's the name that sums up his faithfulness, his faithful love to his people. This is Naomi in the midst of her bitterness saying, the Lord, the covenant and faithful God has brought me back empty. This is a picture I think that we see in Ruth chapter 1. In the midst of all this bitterness, we have this picture of the goodness of God. You think about just think about our lives when we walk through struggle or suffering, trial, tragedy. This is where we wrestle. We wrestle with either one or both of these truths. God is either great or he is good. And we wrestle with, is God really great? Is God really in control? And the, then we ask ourselves this question like, God, how is this good? When you hear that diagnosis from the doctor, whenever you are walking through a struggle with a child or a parent or you're dealing with something at work, when life happens and it doesn't always happen in the way you envision, is this still good? And we struggle with the greatness and we struggle to see the goodness and the greatness of God together in the midst of suffering like this. And this is what the Bible is giving us a real picture of here. And here's the truth, the promise for God's people in his sovereign design. If you walk away with one thing, walk away with this. God ordains sorrowful tragedy to set the stage for surprising triumph. Say that again. God ordains sorrowful tragedy to set the stage for surprising triumph. That's the promise. Remember, the end of Ruth 1, Naomi is looking around. She returns to Bethlehem, and she says, I am empty. I have nothing. And the reality is, from all appearance, appearances, she does have nothing. There are moments of not just how Naomi feels, but this is all over Scripture, isn't it? Like, we, we see this all over the Bible. Famine strikes. Uh, think about Abraham and Isaac, it leads them to another land and for their good in the end. In that famine, uh, it's a famine that leads Jacob's family to set the stage in Egypt for God's powerful salvation in the Exodus. It's barrenness all over Scripture. It's Daniel being thrown into a lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego being thrown into a fiery furnace. It's over and over all throughout Scripture. Why is this happening? And let's be honest. There are times when we think God is far from us. And what I want us to do, we'll fly through these, but think about this. When we're surrounded by famine, not an actual famine, but when we long for what we do not have. I'm not talking about material things here, but when we long for what we do not have, when we long for what we need and we know we need it, yet we don't find ourselves receiving it from God it's not there when everything seems foreign. We find ourselves in a new place. Physically, maybe we find ourselves in a new place emotionally. Maybe their relationship with mom or dad or a child or husband or wife that once was one way, but now is completely different. And you're thinking, how did this happen? When we find ourselves in a new place emotionally, physical, uh, physically with cancer or disease, and you're looking around and you're saying to yourself, this is not how I planned my life. I don't know how I'm going to walk through this. I've never been down this journey before. I never thought I would be in the middle of this journey. When everything seems foreign 
to us. When death strikes your family and the pain just won't go away. And maybe it's a short time ago when death struck her. Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe it was expected. Maybe it was unexpected. The pain won't go away. When despair sinks in our life and we're not sure we really want to continue in our current circumstances, when we feel like there's no way out, like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, admits loneliness in our lives, when no one else understands, even though we lose we, those we love, or maybe when we can't find someone who will love us to walk through this with us, we find ourselves all alone. No one understands. We find ourselves in grief when we hurt and we cry and we, we wrestle in our shame. Maybe things we struggle with we are not proud of, things we struggle with, all these things that other people don't understand in our lives and we can't open up, so we just internalize and suppress it and we, we don't share these things in all our struggles and in all these things. And I'm not trying to be depressing here, but this is real. This is real life. Sometimes we struggle and we suffer When we get that diagnosis, when we hear this news, when this or that happens, that everything changes and we ask ourselves, is God really near all of this? We feel that God is far from us. This is the way I want you to see this promise here in Ruth chapter 1. See see this promise. When we think that God is far from us, we can know, people of God, we can know that God will show himself faithful to us. To us, we can know this. God will show Himself faithful to us. Naomi is saying, I am empty. I have nothing. But little does she know, don't miss this, little does she know that standing right beside her in this Moabite daughter in law is the fullness of God. And in this moment, when she thinks, God is completely gone and far from her. In that moment, God is actually laying the foundation for a great demonstration of faithfulness to her. While this is where we're stopping today in the story, this is not where we have to stop in Scripture. If you could just take a step back with me for a minute, come into a close, and see this picture. This is the gospel. It's the great, glorious, beautiful gospel, God's epic tale of redemption, because here's the reality. Like I said at the beginning, we find ourselves in the middle of this story. We're like Elimelech. We've wandered from God into a land of idolatry. We're Ruth. We're born into a land of idolatry and immorality, children of disobedience, objects of the wrath of God, deserving nothing but the judgment of God. And this is where we find ourselves. And the picture we have in the book of Ruth, in this picture, and we see it all over scripture, is a God who is pursuing after his people in their sin and even using their sin. He's using Elimelech's sin here to set the stage for a a demonstration of his grace on the grand scheme of human history. That's what we're going to talk about next week. This is the great gospel. God taking our sin through Jesus, nailing it to his son on the cross, sets the stage for the grandest picture of his glory to all nations. I hope we can see this. This is the gospel. In our sin, God covers us with his grace. His grace covers our sin, and his his grace covers your sin. Don't miss that. Sin from your past does not dispel your hope from the future. And I think that's what we see in Ruth chapter 1. Sin, praise God, by his grace, sin from your past does not dispel hope from your future. That's the gospel. Because Christ has taken your sin upon himself so that we're not held to our lineage of the past, our land from the past, our gods from the past. We've been freed, and we're a part of that promise of God. He's made made that a reality by turning sorrowful tragedy into of the cross into this surprising triumph of our salvation. This is the gospel. In our grace, God covers our sin. In our sorrow, his mercy overcomes. 
His mercy will overcome our sorrow. Naomi experienced loss. She experienced great loss. She lost everything. We in this room will experience great loss. Some of us have. Here's the deal. It may not be immediately recognized. It may take a long time. It may take many days of patient waiting. But know this. When God seems far from you, you can know he will show himself faithful to you. It's guaranteed eternally for those who trust in him. He will show himself faithful to you. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we praise you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the story of Ruth, of just this beautiful picture. Even in the first chapter, and amidst all this sorrowful tragedy, you are setting the stage for a tr- surprising triumph in you. And God, I pray right now, I know there, is, there are many people who are walking through difficult circumstances right now. Surprising hurt, pain, tragedy, difficult circumstances, new scenes. It's, everything seems foreign in this moment, God. But I just pray that you would comfort them, God, that they would know that they are at peace for those who are trusting you, that you, they can cast their anxieties on you because you care for them. Lord, I pray that we are trusting in you even in the difficult circumstances. It's easy when things are going well, but I pray that that we would just turn to you and surrender ourselves in humble devotion to you, even in the midst of sorrow and tragedy and hurt. We pray these things in Jesus' name.